Good evening, everyone. I hope you all have your good Dutch nap. I'm quite happy with my talk this evening. You know, compared to that, uh, I'll be upstairs while we need for a Dutch minister. <laughs> well, it's good to be here together with you again. Let's be worship God uh, tonight. So, if you are able, please stand with me. Yes. Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory, because your steadfast love is better than mine. My lips will praise you, so I will bless you as long as in your name, I will lift up my hands. Beloved congregation, God greets us through his word, and the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Let us open in prayer. We are your servants, O Lord, and you are our King, and you deserve our undivided attention because you are a jealous God. You deserve to be looked at and be praised and be cherished. Your glory we magnify, your beauty we gaze upon. And we sing with David when he said, one thing have I asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. O oh God, you are our God. Earnestly we seek you. Our God, we will praise you. O oh, you who are the true God, the living God, and the everlasting King, the Lord our God, who is one Lord. You are very great. You are clo clothed with honor and majesty. You cover yourself with light as with a garment. You are light, and in you is no darkness at all. To you we lift up our eyes, O you who are enthroned in the heavens. We ask this time that you bless together as we bless us as we gather together to sing your praise and receive your word. May we bless your name. May we be edified and may we be challenged to go out and lived out gospel truths. This we ask and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us remain standing as we sing, O oh God, you are my God, after which thy loving kindness. Thank you. 
Let us together confess the Apostles' Creed. Beloved congregation, what do you believe? I believe God the Father Almighty, Creator of the Church. I believe in Jesus Christ, who is the only Son of God, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and born of the Virgin Mary. He is suffered in the Pontius Pilate, who was crucified and died. He is the head of the world. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and seated at the right hand of the God the Father. For the dead people of God of the judge who lived in the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the whole Catholic Church, the forgiveness of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of us. Let us sing just as I am.
seated. Join me in prayer. Our gracious God and loving Heavenly Father, it is written in your word that if we ask anything from you, that you will give it to us in, in your name. He said that we should ask so that we may receive and our joy may be full. So we come to the throne of grace of our Heavenly Father, and we ask in Jesus' name so our joy may be full. God, our tender care, we pray with those who are praying. We join the spoken and silent prayers that come to you from throughout the earth, from sanctuaries and street corners, from battle lines and prison cells, from hospital rooms and festival tables. We, with bowed heads and heads held high, standing boldly or kneeling quietly, we pray to you with thanks, with sorrow, with, with urgency. Father, we ask your guidance. We rest in your comfort. May you speak, O oh God, to your praying people everywhere. Here, this is our common prayer and those of our hearts which we offer now. We offer to you, O oh God, our prayers for your world. This is your world and you are its creator. And there is not a square inch in this universe that is outside of your providential care. You are this world's sovereign God. Therefore, we trust in you amidst war and rumors of war, amidst the chaos and the degradation of morals in, in our society, amidst unbelief and worldliness. We mourn, Father, and grieve as we witness how broken and fallen this world has become and will continue to be. But we still place our trust in you, O oh God. May you be a comfort to those who are suffering. May you be their rest. May the glorious gospel of your son, Jesus Christ, be proclaimed so that suffering and struggling sinners will find salvation and receive Christian hope. We offer to you, O oh God, our prayers for your church Catholic, the universal church. Almighty God, you have called us into your church to be your servants in the service of others. Forgive us for falling short of your call. And Father, make us and the whole church more nearly what you would have us to be. We pray for the leaders of this church, we pray for the elders and deacons. We pray for their holiness. We need it as a church. We pray for their family, for their children, their grandchildren. Bless them and be with them and guide them. Give them the wisdom to lead their household with the fear of you as they also lead their spiritual family in this church. May your name be glorified in their service for your, for your congregation. And may your people... In this place, be nourished in the faith. We pray for those who are sick and weak. We pray for healing, strength, and comfort. May the warmth of your love be translated in, into the encouragement and prayers that your people give to one another. We pray for those who seek wisdom and guidance as they make important decisions in their life. May they find help in your word and through their prayers. We offer you, O oh God, our prayers for our children. Grant wisdom and guidance to us parents as we continue to hold our covenant children by their baptism. May you continue to use family devotions and catechism lessons and our witness for their growth in the knowledge of your grace. Please help us as we answer their curious questions about life and the world. And please guide us as we in our own weaknesses and foolishness, strive to be godly parents to them. Finally, we offer you, O God, our hearts. Create a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within us. Cast us not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from us. Restore the joy of your salvation and uphold us with a willing spirit. Let us hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. 
your glory in Christ your Son, our Lord and Savior, by the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let us worship God through the giving of our offering. We now worship God through the preaching of his word. Our text is found in the book of Joel. We will be reading from verses 1 to 13. This is actually the first of the five sermon series. So if you want to hear the rest of the series, you should uh, invite me back, I guess. So I'll be reading from the NIV tonight, the book of Joel, chapter 1, verses 1. We will be reading until verse 12, not 13. Chapter 1, verses 1 to 12. Hear now God's word. The word of the Lord that came to Joel, this son of Pethuel. Hear this, you elders. Listen, all who live in the land. Has anything like this ever happened in your days or in the days of your forefathers? Tell it to your children and let your children tell it to their children and their children to the next generation. What the locust swarm has left, the great locusts have eaten. What the great locusts have left, the young locusts have eaten. What the young locusts have left, other locusts have eaten. Wake up, you drunkards, and weep. Well, all you drinkers of wine, well, because of the new wine, for it has been snatched from your lips. A nation has invaded my land, powerful and without number. It has the teeth of a lion, the fangs of a lioness. It has laid waste my vines and ruined my fig trees. It has stripped off their bark and thrown it away, leaving their branches white. Mourn like a virgin in sackcloth, grieving for the husband of her youth. Grain offerings and drink offerings are cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests are in mourning, those who minister before the Lord. The fields are ruined. The ground is dried up. The grain is destroyed. The new wine is dried up. The oil fails. Despair, you farmers. Wail, you vine growers. Grieve for the wheat and the barley because the harvest of the field is destroyed. The vine is dried up and the fig, fig tree is wither. The pomegranate, the palm, and the apple tree, all the trees of the field are dried up. Surely the joy of mankind is withered away. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we pray that tonight as we open your word, as we have read from the book of Joel, trouble, famine has come to the land of Judah. And when we look around our community and this nation, 
around the world, we face the same trouble. I mean, you call us as your church to rise up, to hear your word, to awaken, and to call upon you for salvation for our own selves and for the people around us. That's the preaching of your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, our access to information gives us an advantage to know the current state of affairs and unbelievably so about anything and anywhere in the world. Technology can be you know, terrifying, as you know, but we can definitely make use of it to the glory of God. Now consider this. With the information we have and we can access, we can literally pray for humanity's concerns without ceasing. Right? That's the generation we're in right now. That's the time. 50 years ago, even 30, 40 years ago, you can only know the news, you know, East Martin, right? Or Michigan, but not around the world. We can pray without ceasing. But why don't we do it then? And I think, I believe, sensory overload is the problem. All the things we see through our screen phones, televisions, iPads, and laptops, right? All the things that we hear from the radio broadcast, news online, or news coming out of you know the information loaded tongues from the people around us. All the things that we feel whenever we see and hear all this information, right? Creates a lot of emotions, anger toward the bad guys in politics, in the streets, in other parts of the world. Anxiety because of war, and rumors of war, rejoicing with a now pregnant friend from 8,000 miles in the Philippines because of Facebook. And I can celebrate with her just by clicking heart react, right? Celebrating with them. This sensory overload may bring a paralyzing effect to the church being militant. Being overly stimulated has its tendency to make us get used to all the news, good and bad, and especially the bad, that instead of making us care, it makes us indifferent. We get used to it, right? What's happening now in Russia and Ukraine, Israel and Palestine, we get used to it. It's, it's every day in our news feed. In Facebook, CNN. When God sent the locusts to Judah, the devastation they saw with their eyes, the crying of suffering people they heard day in and day out, the smell of fear in the air and fear written in the faces of mothers and children, the hunger from the lack of supply, the taste of death, anticipating the inevitable demise of warm bodies around them, there was only one thing left to do, care. Caring for what's happening around us means praying for the salvation of sinners. Praying and even fighting for justice against evil people. Speak up. Being intentional in calling out Repentance the, and, and to repentance the way ward. Cultivating love and compassion for the oppressed. Caring means appreciating the church that proclaims good news and supporting missions work and mourning for the brokenness of this world. In the first chapter of Joel, the people of Judah are in trouble. Locust swarms have come, and it comes as a judgment from God. They are called not only to care, but to repent from their unbelief and turn to the Lord for salvation. That is the message of prophet Joel. 
So likewise, brothers and sisters in Christ, let us be aware of sin within our own hearts and sin's effects without and around us. And let us turn to God for salvation while also being signposts for others to find their way back to God. Now, the only thing we know about Prophet Joel, besides it's a good name, is that he is the son of Pethuel. That's it. Many have speculated when this book was written. And the simple answer is that we do not know exactly. And not knowing concrete details about the book and the prophet himself makes it challenging for us to understand the context. And we know as Reformed people, the context is king. Therefore, we can also say that God has probably intended it to be that way. That what we see here in this nation, particularly, these observable, devastating effects of sin has been there since the fall and will always be present in all epochs of history in this time and age until the second coming of Jesus Christ. Or what this book eventually would refer to as the day of the Lord. And that's the second sermon. This world is the context of the message of God's prophet. And today's sermon calls us to four responses. Hear, tell, awake, and lament. Those are the four imperatives that we see in chapter 1, verses 1 to 12. Hear, tell, awake, and lament. First point here in verse 1, we read that the word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel. The first seven words are foundational to the whole book. The word of the Lord that came. This is the good news. God has not abandoned his people. And that's in verse 1. The word of the Lord still comes. Yes, the locust swarm shall rampage through all that is living and will kill them. But God in his word, his people that time can lay hold of his promises. He's the giver of life, the sustainer of all, the deliverance. They can lay hold of God's faithfulness. He shall deliver them if they repent of their sins. This tells us several truths, brothers and sisters. God is present even in brokenness. As long as the word of God is being proclaimed in this church, in the streets, in the schools, there is hope. It comforts the saints and conquers sinners. There is hope when your minister or your invited seminarian still preaches the Bible and not the newspaper. That is hope. The second truth is God's word warns, yes, but it also washes, right? Joe's message is a message of judgment. Yes, it's heavy. It's a heavy book. But Joel's message is also a discipline from a heavenly father to his beloved children. Therefore, the proper response to our hearing of God's word, whenever we receive it, is to reflect. The prophet Joel asked a question, a reflective question in verse 2. He said, hear this, you elders. Listen, all who live in the land. Here's the question. Has anything like this ever happened in your days or in the days of your forefathers? By asking this question, people were made to reflect of their sins against God. Now, again, it's not clear what particular sin Joel was addressing in this book. But there is no doubt that the locust swarms are punishment for their sin and that God is calling them to repentance. And we can see that in verse 14, right? Let me read verse 14. Declare a holy fast. Call a sacred assembly. 
Summon the elders and all who live in the land to the house of the Lord your God and cry out to the Lord. Then verse 15, Alas for that day, for the day of the Lord is near. It will come like destruction from the Almighty. Now let me read verses 3 to 4 again, which is the initial description of that destruction. Tell it to your children and let your children tell it to their children and their children to the next generation. What the locust swarm has left, the great locusts have eaten. What the great locusts have left, the young locusts have eaten. What the young locusts have left, other locusts have eaten. The devastation that the locust swarms brought about the people of God and their land are so severe that it should make them not only turn back from their sin, but also let the next three generations know that sin destroys. It's a, it's a very practical, reflective question and image. What we do now affects the next three generations. If we do not preach the gospel now, the next three generations will go to hell. It's a vivid image. It's a scary image, to be honest. Right? The image that we can see here is makes us to, to reflect. Right? The imagery of locusts as the judgment was known to be used against Egypt, right? As the eighth of the ten plagues. And it's probably what the prophet was referring in verse two. Has such a thing happened? Now, locust swarms are probably pretty common in those days. But this time, the prophet Joel was clear this is a punishment from God. And asking the people, has such a thing happened in the past? They're made to reflect what happened to Egypt when God sent that eighth plague. But the prophet of Joel, now this is interesting, in this book speaks to God's people in God's land, not to his enemy in a foreign land. Now one key literary style among the Old Testament prophets is the style of, they call it satirical parody, a satire, a mockery, basically. Israel witnessed in the past how God intervenes and saves them from their enemies through a local swarm thrown against Egypt. But now, it's against God's own people. And Joel seems to say, well, I guess we have come to this. A punishment for God's enemies is poured out to his people. Now, America is supposed to be a Christian nation. Philippines is the only Christian nation in Asia. But we're number four in the most corrupt country in Asia. Corruption is very bad. And we look around our community. Right? And we see the parallelism here between the locust swarm in this book and in the book of Exodus. All right, let me read quickly in Exodus chapter 10, verses 5 to 6. They shall cover the face of the land so that no one can see the land. And they shall eat what is left to you after the hill. And they shall eat every tree of yours that grows in the field. And they shall fill your houses and the houses of all your servants and of all the Egyptians as neither your fathers nor your grandfathers have seen from the day they came on earth to this day. Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and Exodus chapter 10, verse 3 tells us God's word to Pharaoh, how long will you refuse to humble yourself? Brothers and sisters in Christ, isn't this the most basic definition of what hearing and, God, and heeding God's word means? Humbling ourselves. Jonathan Edwards said this about humility. Nothing sets a person so much out of the devil's reach as humility. For Judah, 
the locust swarms needed to happen for them to acknowledge their sins against God and humble themselves. It's a humbling experience. Everything you own dies. God had to remove from them their source of living. God had to take away from them anything they can boast of. The lack of humility is not only the root of unbelief, but as well as its fruit. So let us humbly hear God's word and let us diligently tell it to others. Joel is calling people to humble themselves and turn to God for salvation. Hear God's word. Hear God's word. And point number two, tell. It says in our text, tell your children about it and let your children tell their children and their children to another generation. Just as Pharaoh's unbelief was punished, the people of God will also be punished because of their unbelief. So let us tell one another God's word, right? Tell one another that God punishes unbelief. Let us tell one another God's word. Speaking God's word to one another is now a lost art, right? There is a fear to offend now. There is a fear to be oppressive. There is a fear to be hurtful and say judging words. We are not called to be careful. We are called to be faithful. Reprove sin whenever it is necessary. Point out unbelief. Be strong and courageous. Now, what is unbelief? What is its relationship to a hard heart like Pharaoh's and God's call to his people for repentance? Let me define it in a way that the kids could also understand it. Unbelief is not trusting God and his word. When we do not trust God and his word, guess what happens? It's indicative that we trust our own hearts and our own words. The Bible tells us that our hearts can be deceitful. It can be selfish. We need to trust God more than anyone else, more than ourselves, because he knows best. So children, always listen to God and his word. God speaks to the children in several ways. Right? He speaks to the children every Lord's Day when we listen to God's preaching of our pastor. He speaks to us when our Sunday school teachers teach us his word. He speaks to us when our parents read to us his word or remind us of what God says in his word. Whenever they pray for us and with us God's word and even when we sing psalms and hymns. Let us trust God and his words. And to our parents, even grandparents, I encourage all of us to talk to our kids about the preaching that we hear every Lord's Day, right? Summarize it for them. Because locust swarms could be fun for the kids, right? A lot of bugs, you know, nice weather. Let's go outside and run around. That's what my kids did with the uh, leap grandchildren. <laughs> but we explain to them God's word. Let's come up with applications that are sensible to them and are concrete for them. Make time for family worship. Because the cure to unbelief is to immerse ourselves in the word of God. That's the only cure to unbelief. Hear him speak. Because the book of Joel may paint a dark sky as the locust swarms deem the light of the sun, if you will. But the sun is there to stay. And that is the most comforting truth in this book. God has never abandoned his people. 
if there's one thing that God cannot do, he cannot contradict himself. He is faithful. God was not silent in this book. God has spoken. Hear and tell of God's word. Even amidst the local swarms, God still speaks to his covenant people. And likewise, even amidst the degradation of the morals in our society, evil among the leaders of this supposedly Christian nation, even if liberalism is creeping into the pews and pulpits of Christian denominations, God's word is still more powerful to save, transform, and restore. Therefore, let us not waver in proclaiming God's word. First to our hearts, reflectively in all humility, and second to our neighbors. Parents, are we, are we catechizing our children and our children's children in the word of God? In this age and time, you see, we can only do so much to filter what they learn and not learn from this world. But it is only a matter of time before this world catechizes our children and our children's children of worldliness. Ground them in God's word. Ground them in a community that abides in God's word. Diligently read to them God's word. Sing to them God's word. Be patient in answering their curious questions and answer them with sensible answers drawn from the depths of God's rich words. Be that prophet Joel to the little Judas. John Calvin said, He who is armed with the power of God will not tremble at the noise raised by the world. So here... And tell of God's word. The third point is awake. The swarming locusts, if you have ever seen them in person, or if you have ever watched them on the internet, you now I have not seen one. It's funny because when I was writing this sermon a while back, Facebook reminded me of a memory 11 years ago. I was in Mindanao, where Ruth was from, and I was eating fried locust spicy fried locust very good protein but it's interesting i haven't seen one i don't have any idea how devastating it is but if you see them for example in the internet it's a sight to behold and not in a good way it is as verse 4 tells us a destroying locust it is powerful beyond and beyond in number and we can sense the urgency of the command in verse 5. Awake, you drunkards, and weep and wail, all you drinkers of wine, because of the sweet wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. That's from the ESV. Well, let me ask you a question. Have you ever tried waking up a drunk person? Exactly. That's the point. Was the prophet Joel speaking to actual drunkards among God's people? Probably. But it, it is also possible that he is describing the state of their spirituality. A spiritual slumber causes and furthers unbelief and disobedience. Complacency, reluctance. If we are in a spiritual slumber, we must be awakened. And we must be awakened forcefully. Scripture is pretty clear in using the image of drunkenness as description of a person who is indulging in the desires of the flesh. It has always a negative connotation and is often contrasted with being filled with the Spirit, right? Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18, do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, interestingly, wine was also used as an image of celebration, wisdom and blessing especially if you read proverbs so drinking wine was essential into those in those days for their health for religious practices and for community celebration and consumption wine was not the problem the abuse of it was that's a good lesson for us blessings are not supposed to be an end in themselves 
Blessings have two purposes. To show that God is the source of all good and perfect gifts? Yes. But second, there is no blessing in this world that could fully satisfy our longings. Therefore, blessings should point us back to the only one who can fill our cup. Sweet wine, no matter how good it is, could only satisfy for a season. But the true vine, who is Jesus Christ, is the only one who truly satisfies. And abiding in him is the only way to have our cups overflow. And you have heard it said, apart from Christ, we can do nothing. Now, the second part of verse 5 signifies taking from God's people the opportunity to drink and enjoy the blessing of life as punishment. It says here, for it has been snatched from your lips, the new wine. He was speaking of the new wine. You know, wine preserves life, basically. The locust swarms destroy the vineyard. Wine barrels are empty. No time and resources to celebrate life and love. Isn't it what sin does to us? Sin tricks us into thinking that gratifying the flesh brings satisfaction. But no, it only brings sorrow, despair, misery, and emptiness. Sin promises a good night's rest and sweet dreams only to be awakened by a bad nightmare. Look how verses 6 and 7 describe the locust swarm. Now, most scholars believe that it's actually the locust swarm being described by a colonizing enemy nation, not the other way around. So listen, verses 6 to 7. A nation has invaded my land, powerful and without number. It has the teeth of a lion, the fangs of a lioness. It has laid waste my vines and ruined my fig trees. It has stripped off their park and thrown it away, leaving their branches white. The locust swarms are likened to a rampaging and colonizing nation, killing everything that has life and everything that gives and sustains life. And wine being cut off from our mouth is figuratively saying that sin destroys lives. It takes away our joy, right? It disrupts our peace and quiet. They are replaced by misery, hopelessness, and helplessness, and death. Sin makes even the sweetest wine bitter. And the language and the imagery that the prophet Joel are using were not foreign to Judah. They know exactly what it's like to be conquered by enemy nations. Go back to Judges. They know how the effects can be felt into the third or more generations to be in exile. That is what sin will do if not dealt with. That is what drunkenness and slumber will experience if not rebuked and awoken. The mighty John Owen said, sin aims always at the utmost. It is like the grave that is never satisfied. On the other hand, we might think that I am preaching to the choir, right? We might think that we are okay because we have not committed grievous sins. We have not forsaken the church. We regularly pray and read our Bible, so we are okay. But this is also applicable to our temper. To our mood swings, our impatience, probably to our kids, our spouse, toward others. You see, there is never a justification for a bad temper, normatively. And this is what we call this what we call little sins could be those few locusts jumping around, and if not dealt with, could bring about a locust swarm. Right? It's that one fence that we remove from its place in our reformed tradition. That small compromise could lead to the fall of the church. 
the effects of our sins, how big or little they may be, they have effects. Usually, people around us get affected. And that is one of the many reasons why we must, as our fourth point will tell us, lament sin and its effects. Fourth point, lament. One of the devastating effects of sin is that the sin of one affects many. And that is what verses 8 to 12 are all about from a drunkard in verse 5. Now the desolation and the destructive effects of sin have affected other people. The priests and the ministers in verse 10. The tillers of the soil and the vine dressers in verse 11. And here's the worst part in verse 12. The joy of mankind. I like how the ESB puts it. He said, and the children of man. It's only a matter of time before a whole pile of fresh put tomatoes is corrupted when mixed with a rotten one. The locust swarms as punishment from God to all the people of the land begs us to ask the questions, right? Were the priests and the ministers the ones who were described as drunkards in verse 5? Were they literally drunkards? Were they, was Joel speaking to the spiritual state of the temple during that time? That's possible. Are the tealers of the soil and the vine dressers were the problem? The workers, the priests and the ministers are in church, but people are worried about their own welfare outside at the expense of God's temple. That could be the case putting their work and their needs over their spiritual needs. How about the children of man in verse 12? Whose sins are actually being dealt with by God? All of Judah, the priests and the ministers, the people, the drunkards and the, spir the spiritually bankrupt? The answer is that we are not told. But one thing is clear, and this is a sad description of how powerful and destructive sin is, its effects are always widespread. How many marriages and families have been destroyed by just one foolish decision? One wrong move could turn the family tree upside down. The cutting locust, the swarming locust, and the destroying locust in verse 4 do not just happen. Guess how it happened? One locust is hopping around, affecting another to hop around. And that is exactly how locust swarms start. The science of locust swarm was described like this. Let me read. Locusts are actually a group of short-horned grasshoppers. They are usually solitary. They're introverts. Fairly bland-looking insects but they can switch into a gregarious mode, becoming social, multicolored eating machines that sweep across the landscape in swarms up to 80 million locusts per square kilometer. I don't know what that is in per square mile. I read the right way of, you know, but you see the point. It's scary. It is fascinating. It's a fascinating description of people who think they can get away with their sins and their private sins, but are sorely mistaken. Jesus himself said, your sins will find you out. There is no such thing as hidden sin. No sin is ever committed in secret because first, God knows everything. Second, it will show in and through our thoughts, our words, and deeds. People around us will be affected. Sin hurts us and those who are around us. Look at verse 12, one of the saddest realities that sin brings into the world. Let me read the ESV version. And gladness dries up, that is the wine, from the children of man. And gladness dries up from the children of wine. Brothers and sisters in Christ, let us lament the brokenness of this world. In our prayers, 
Let's weep for this broken nation. Let us weep for our youth that are being led astray. Let us be stirred within. Let our hearts be broken for what sins have brought to this world to our family, to our community, to our churches. Lament the strife that the strife sin has caused between family members, brothers and sisters in Christ, and even among nations. And here's some more. Lament these things. Did you know that the yearly revenue of the immoral film industry here in the U.S., is bigger than the yearly revenue of NBA, NFL, and MLB combined? To be exact, it's almost three times. Did you know that one out of four children in America is fatherless? Did you know that in 2020, there were almost a million abortions in the U.S. alone? Did you know that there are 20, 22 million images of child pornography? There is a 5,000 increase over the last five years. It is considered the fastest international crime that the world has ever seen. Lament the brokenness of this world. Let us, let us not be indifferent. Let us call to God for salvation, for the salvation of these children. These are but a speck of the observable devastation that sin brings into this world, God's world. Brothers and sisters, the locust swarms paints a picture of the reality of sin and its effects. But here's the gospel. God sits on his throne unmoved. God is still the center of the book of Joel, no matter how heavy its message may be. No matter how we think, this is probably not appropriate for an evening service after that wonderful lunch, right? But no, we have to hear this message. Therefore, there is still hope. Because lamenting does not mean we lack faith. Lamenting actually tells us that we long for deliverance. Grieving our pains, for example, is not, is not an indicative that we lack faith. Grieving the brokenness of this world, our suffering, our cancer, the pain that our family members are going through, grieving them, means that we look forward to the day of the Lord, the final salvation, where there is no pain no more. And looking forward to waking up from a nightmare and unto a new day when the sun is shining bright like today, feeling the warmth of God's goodness on our face, enjoying good wine with good company, tilling the ground, pruning the vines in thankfulness and joy. We can and we must lament the brokenness of this world with faith. Faith that God shall use even the darkness of time to shed light to his purposes in our lives. For this church, shed light to his purposes in our lives. Faith that God shall save and sustain his people through his word. Faith that God shall bring an end to sin in the day of the Lord. Brothers and sisters in Christ, the day of the Lord shall bring an end to evil. The day of the Lord shall bring into eternal bliss his people. So let us cling to Christ, brothers and sisters. He is king. He is ruler. He is deliverer. He is merciful. He is compassionate. He is restorer. And he is reason. He wins. 
Let's pray. Our gracious God and loving Heavenly Father, we look around and we see brokenness. May you help us and may you help our unbelief. May we as your people who have been saved from our sins and brokenness feel compassion for the people, the families, the community, the nation, and this world that is broken. Help us to intercede for, for one another, to intercede for those who are suffering because of evil. Intercede for those sinners to repent. Intercede for our own sinfulness. Help us to be on our knees every day to pray for the salvation of the lost. To pray for the salvation of our community, of our nation, of this world. Help us to take part in what you are doing in your world. Help us and help our unbelief. We praise you and we entrust to you all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us respond by singing, Cleanse Me. God's parting blessing through the reading of his word. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you 
and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. <laughs>